Amen. To me, that's awesome. We are just so thankful today uh, for all of you who are military, first responders, veterans. We just appreciate you so much and just so thankful for just your service. Know that you're loved and appreciated today. And that's one of the main reasons that we wanted to, uh, to be able to do that uh, with you and for you today. Now, one of the things that I really love about our military and first responders is their example of sacrificial service. I mean, they are uh, people who put their lives on the line nearly every day by their vocation. And I think inside of our souls, there, there's part of us that longs, longs to, to live lives of sacrifice. We long to live lives of significance, purpose, character, blessing. Uh, we, we all long for that. And so I want to start out by asking you this question today in terms of, of being an extraordinary person. What if you decided, what if you decided today that you are going to be extraordinary? Well, what would that look like? What would an extraordinary version of you look like? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be extraordinary at something. We know all kinds of people that are extraordinary at things that aren't necessarily extraordinary people. But what if you decided in all the different roles, all the different uh, vocations, so to speak, that you have in your life, that you were going to be extraordinary? And every time that you came to some kind of, of crossroads, whether that be temptation or whether that be an opportunity that you had to do something good, well, what if you ask yourself the question, what would an extraordinary person do at this juncture? What would an extraordinary person do? And today, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to say to you that actually that's what God calls you to do. That's what he re requires of you. And here's why. Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe in a personal God and that that God has a plan for your life. That God knows your name and that he sent his son Jesus Christ to be able to die on the cross for your sins. And you believe that God started this world and he will finish what he started. And history is actually heading toward a destination. And that every day matters. And that one day you and I will be held accountable for how that we have lived our lives. And you also believe that every single person that you have ever seen, every single person that you have ever met, is made in the image of God. And, and, and because they're made in the image of God, they deserve, they deserve to be treated in an extraordinary way. Not because uh, they're a follower of Jesus or not, because, or not a follower of Jesus, they're, they deserve to be treated in an extraordinary way. But at the same time, we all know we don't live in an extraordinary all the time, way all the time. We fail, don't we? We don't live up to that kind of a standard. We don't do what's right. And that's really the same kind of tension that was going on in the book of Judges, where there was, a, there was an understanding but not living up to that standard. So remember, as we've been digging into this a book, that Judges is a 310-year period that happened after Moses and Joshua got the people into the Promised Land, but it was before uh, the first king of Israel, Saul. But when the Israelites, they got into the Promised Land, they did what most of us do. Instead of looking up to God and following God, they started looking around them. They started looking around at all those other people around them. And they started looking at the culture and what they were doing, and pretty soon... Israelites were looking around and saying, I want some of that over there. And I want to do that over there. And I want some of that. So they're looking up to God. They started looking around to what the people around there were, they were doing. And they began to be tempted. And God was saying, no, no, no. no don't do those things. You're going to dilute your influence. You're going to end up being like everybody else. And if you end up like everybody else, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt other people. But the nation of Israel said, no, we want to be like everybody else. We, we want to fit in. And they started being like everybody else, and they started following the other gods around them. And so we see in the book of Judges that every time the nation of Israel 
They'd start looking around and they'd start following the gods that were around them. God, in his love, would discipline them. So the nation of Israel, all the way through the book of Judges, goes through this cycle where they would disobey God. There would be a disaster. The people would cry out. They would repent. And then God would deliver them. Now, the judge that we started talking about a couple weeks ago was a guy named Gideon. And to me, Gideon is a person a lot like you and I. He believed in God, but he became an ordinary person. He was just like everybody else. He believed the story uh, that, he, that had been told to him about himself. He started believing the story that was really be, uh, being perpetrated in his culture. But we saw a couple weeks ago, God comes to him and shakes him. He says, Gideon, what are you doing? Gideon, how did you become so ordinary? How is it, Gideon, that you forgot your destiny and the destiny that I have for you and your people? And I want you to wake up, Gideon. I want you to believe that you're a person who can do extraordinary things. Not because it's going to be because of your positive mental thinking. And it's not because, Gideon, you're going to reach your potential. It's not because of anything of those things, Gideon. It's because the Spirit of God rests on you. That's why you're going to be able to do extraordinary things. Now remember the context of what's going on with Gideon. Uh, and the people of Israel, once again, the people of Israel had turned away from God. They had started following the Baals, other gods of the people around them. And as a result, disaster struck the Israelites once again. The Midianites started attacking them, uh, burning their crops, killing their animals. And so the Israelites begin to cry out to God. But what's incredible that we see over and over again in the book of Judges is that every time that the people of Israel fail... Every time we fail, when we turn back to God, God takes us back. That's the gracious spirit and loving spirit of our God. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that God all the time, he shields us from the consequences of our poor decisions, just like he didn't shield the Israelites from the consequences of their poor decisions. Because you and I are the same way. If, if we don't experience consequences many times, we just keep doing the same old dumb stuff, don't we? If we don't have a little bit of pain sometimes, and we know that when, if, if, you, if you're here and you have children, you know that sometimes unless they have pain, they just keep doing the same old thing. And that's exactly the way the Israelites were, and that's exactly the way we are. So last time we saw Gideon, we saw that, I mean, he was deathly afraid. He was so afraid of what was going on with the Midianites and how that they were oppressing the people of Israel and himself personally that he was down in this hole threshing his wheat. I mean, he was so afraid, so defeated, so discouraged. And he, he's down in a hole. He's, he's trying to protect himself. And I'm not so ignorant to think that today I know that some of you are feeling a little bit like Gideon. He came here to church and man, there's stuff going on in your life around you that has caused you and made you feel discouraged, defeated, and afraid. And so you're kind of hunkered down. You're kind of hunkered down. You're, you've got a lot of those feelings, like Gideon was going, being feeling defeated, feeling discouraged, feeling like there, there's no hope on the other side. But I want you to look what happens in our story. Gideon, God comes to Gideon. And, and, he, and he says to Gideon, hey, Gideon, I am with you. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> and like we talked about last time, man, when God came to Gideon and said that, Gideon replies, if the Lord is with us, then why have all this happened to us? God, God says to Gideon, well, you know, why have all these bad things happened to me? Kind of like sometimes we come to God in our confusion, in our defeat, in our discouragement. We say, God, why does all this stuff happen to me? God, why am I still single? God, how come we can't have kids? God, how come I've got all these health problems? God, why, why have all these bad things happened to me? And the God of the universe know that he is not offended by your questions. He's not offended by my questions. He's a big God. He can handle it. He's not offended at all. But know that God is not the author of evil in your life. 
So much of the difficulty that we face in this life is because evil has entered into this world. It entered into the world way back in Adam and Eve. And this world, we live in the consequences of sin from that point forward. And that's why people get old and they die. It's because sin entered into the world. And that's why there's disease and sickness in this world. It's because sin entered into the world. And that's why we had two tornadoes over in Eureka, Kansas, for the last for you know two tornadoes in, in three years. It's because, ultimately, because sin entered in the world. And when sin entered in the world, it started creating chaos. But God is so good and he is so powerful that he can even take evil, the evil that happens in this world, and he can redeem it and he can use it for good. That's how powerful God is. He can take dead things and bring them back to life. That's how powerful and how good God is. So, God tells Gideon right after this, he says, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asks, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. And we can see here in this first part of these verses, man, Gideon does not have a very high view of himself. He doesn't, he doesn't have very much, certainly, confidence in himself and certainly not very much confidence in, in God. But, what, but what's so powerful is that God sees him totally different. It's kind of like they're having this conversation and God says to him, Gideon, you're a mighty warrior. And Gideon says, no, I'm not. I'm, from, I'm the least of the tribe of my family. And God says, yes, you are, Gideon. And Gideon says, no, I'm not. And God says, yes, you are. So what about you today? Does the God of the universe, as he looked down upon you? And maybe today you're feeling a little bit defeated and a little bit discouraged. And God says, Lord's with you, mighty warrior. He's with you. And you say, no, I'm not. God, you can't be with me. He says, yes, you are. You are a mighty warrior. And I want to say to you today, are you going to believe all the things that you are saying about yourself? Are you going to believe your, the, the estimation maybe that everybody else has about you? Or are you going to believe what the God of the universe says about you and what he believes in you? That he is with you, that he is in you, that he is for you today. Are you going to believe that? Because that's exactly what God was saying to Gideon and that's exactly what he says to us today. And I believe that if we would grasp that just for a moment, that God is with us, in us, and for us, it would change the trajectory of our lives. Just like it changes, we're going to see the trajectory of Gideon's life. So God here in essence is saying, come on, Gideon. Come on. Come on. See yourself the way I see you. See things differently. I want you to do something extraordinary, Gideon. I will be with you. And I believe the next question uh, could have possibly been, in essence, first he tells him, I will be with you, but I think the question maybe next to Gideon, I think honestly is to us today, will we be with God? He's with us. If you're here in a follower of Jesus Christ, know that God is with you, in you, and for you. But will we be with God? Will we follow him? Will we be faithful to him? Will we trust him? Will we do what he says? Will we be with God? Now, if we rewind back in our story a, cu a couple weeks ago, in part one of our story, Gideon was living like nobody else, like everybody else, and, and look where it got him. But God comes to him, and it begins to really fill his heart and his soul with his presence. He gets out of his cave. He begins to trust God. And then the next step that Gideon took was that he got his own house in order. He dealt with his own sin in his own life and in the life of his family. Remember what he did? He knocked down the altar to Baal. He cut down the Asherah pole. So let's see what happens next then. Well, next in our story, God reassures Gideon of his call that he's supposed to go and conquer the Midianites. And so Gideon goes out and he gathers 32,000 men from the Israelite tribes uh, and, and who were going to fight on the behalf of Israel against uh, the Midianite army. Now, at one level, 32,000. Sounds like a lot of men. But if you look at Judges chapter 7, the Midianite army had 135,000 men. But God comes to Gideon, and he says, ironically, you've got 32,000 men. Gideon, that's too many. 
That's too many. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to reduce the number of men. Because if you defeat them with 32,000 men, you're still going to think you did it in your own power. You're going to still try to claim victory for yourself. He said, I want you to reduce the number. I want you to go to the men, and if any of those men are afraid, you tell them if you're afraid, you can go home. So Gideon goes to the men and says, hey, if any of you guys are afraid to go into this battle, you go home. 22,000 of those men left. And so God says to Gideon again, he says to him again, you're down to 10,000 men, but he says to him again, no, Gideon, you've still got too many men. You're still probably going to try to claim the victory for yourself. Here's what I want you to do, Gideon. I I want you to take your men down to the spring and allow them to get a drink of water. And those men who get down on their knees to get something to drink, I want you to eliminate them. But those men who scoop the water with their hand and bring it up to their mouths, those are the men I want you to keep. And and Gideon was greatly distressed. He takes his men down to the spring and he takes them down there and they get their water. And to his great distress, only 300 The original 300. The original 300 of those 10,000 men brought the water up to their mouths. Well, needless to say, Gideon, he was getting a little bit nervous again. How's this really going to work out? And so God says to him, if you're still a little bit nervous, I want you to sneak down into the camp of the enemy and listen to what they're saying. So Gideon sneaks down over the hill where the enemy is about ready to go to sleep, and he overhears these two soldiers talking. And what Midianite says, I had a strange dream. I dreamed of a huge loaf of bread. It tumbled out of the hills and it crushed our tent. The other man replied in terror, that can only have one meaning. The sword of Gideon and his army, they are going to overtake us. Their God has delivered us into their hands. Man, when Gideon hears that, he gets so excited. He rushes back to his men. He wakes up all 300 of them and he says, get up. The Lord has given the Midianites into our hands this very night. So here's the first lesson I want you to learn today from Gideon in terms of a being extraordinary. The extraordinary person I believe that God wants us to be. Be extraordinary by joining forces with others. God didn't, you know, Gideon didn't, you know, try to go down there and take on the Midianite army by himself. No. Ultimately what he did was he joined forces. He got those 32,000. God wanted to whittle that down, but ultimately he got those 300 men and they joined forces together and he went to go attack against him. And so many times when we confront the evil in our life and when we confront the evil out there in the world or the problems of this world, we try to do it alone. We try to do it alone. God never intended us to function that way whatsoever. He gave us the body of Christ. He gave us community, the community of one another to be able to deal with the sin in our own lives and to be able to deal with the problems of this world. And that's why in the scriptures, it says things like Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, where it says two are better than one. They have good return for their work, but if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. We are... Better together, aren't we? And we say that a lot at Pathway Church because that's how God has told us to be able to follow him. We follow Jesus in community for others. And that's why we do it in home teams. And that's why we do it in ministry teams. Because that's the way God created us. And that's how we can be the extraordinary people that God wants us and he calls us to be able to be. Is that we join forces with one another. Well, let's see what happens next in our story. Gideon goes back to the camp where the rest of his men are at. But remember, there's 300 of them. There's 135,000 Midianites. Odds are impossibly stacked against them. 450 to 1. That's what the odds are right now. So he divided the men into three groups of 100. Then beginning with verse 19, it says, Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just after they had changed the guard. Three companies then blew trumpets and smashed clay jars that they had brought with them and grasping torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands trumpets, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. And as a result, The Lord caused the men throughout the Midianite camp and terror to turn on each other with their swords and they killed one another. 
And the Bible says after that, the Midianites turned, after they turned on each other, the Israelites, they routed the rest of the Midianite army and drove them all the way back to the land of Gideon. So here's the next lesson I want you to underline today about being the extraordinary people that God wants us to be. Be extraordinary by engaging in God-sized ventures. That's what Gideon did. That's what Gideon and those 300 men did. They, they engaged in this God-sized venture. And God did something incredible, far beyond what they could ever ask or imagine. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the story of something that happened back in World War II. It's called the Battle of Dunkirk. I don't know if you saw the movie Dunkirk that came out uh, a few months ago. Great movie. I encourage you to go, to go see it. But in May of 1940, Adolf Hitler's army had already invaded and conquered much of Europe. Uh, the French army, along with a large number of English soldiers, bravely tried to stop the oncoming German army. But after 40 days of fighting, the Allied forces were completely routed and they retreated all the way back to the English Channel. Close to 500,000 British and French soldiers found themselves trapped in this tiny coastal town of Dunkirk. The German army was only 15 miles away and the German warplanes had already begun bombing them. There seemed to be no hope. No hope. For these 500,000 men, all the Allied forces commanders had, had really just felt like that they were doomed. Well, on May 23rd, the Archbishop of Canada, Canterbury called for a national day of prayer. This is part of the, of the story that the movie leaves out, all right? But people began to pray. Churches all throughout the country of England were filled with people from all walks of life as they sought God's divine intervention to protect and save their loved ones and to save their country. And on May 24th, one day after the call for prayer, Hitler ignored the advice of many of his generals and ordered his armies to hold their positions while Dunkirk was bombed from a distance. Then by God's divine intervention, thunderstorms and thick fog moved in making it difficult for the German warplanes to fly, much less see, severely hampering the German operation to bomb Dunkirk. Then on the evening of May 26, an order was issued for boats of all shapes and sizes to cross the English Channel and to rescue as many men as possible. Naval ships couldn't get close to the beaches for the rescue, so smaller boats, smaller boats were critical in transporting men to the larger ships and, and all the way back, many of them, to England. Accepting this God-sized challenge took tremendous courage for these little boat operators. But they knew that not taking action at this point in history would have devastating consequences. So they chose to risk their lives and 336,000 men were rescued on little boats and yachts. And this ragtag group of people went back and forth across the English Channel saving these men. It was called the miracle at Dunkirk. You see what happens when we engage in something God-sized? The people of Great Britain, they called out in prayer. And then they joined forces together and they took on this God-sized challenge and it changed the course of human history. And God wants exactly the same thing for you and I. The Spirit of God rests on you. It rests on you. And He wants to do extraordinary things through your life. And so I want to ask you that question again. What if you decided? What if you decided to be extraordinary? What if you really believed what if you really believed that God was with you and in you and for you? What would you do? What would you engage in? What would you try? What would you attempt if you knew that the God of this universe was in you, with you, and for you? And I don't know what that is uh, uh, for you. I don't know if for you, maybe that's working with the poor. Maybe for you, that's, that's, that's stepping out and going on a short-term mission trip. Maybe that for you, it's going and working as a sidewalk counselor at an abortion clinic. Maybe for you, it's running for public office. I don't know what that is for you. But what if you believed and trusted that the God was with you, in you, and for you? And I believe that if you would just grasp that for a moment, it would change, it would radically change the trajectory of your life 
and know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ here, that is true of you today. See yourself as God sees you. Maybe you feel down and defeated and discouraged today, but the Spirit of God rests on you. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. He is with you, and he will be with you forevermore, and he has extraordinary plans for your life. Trust it, believe it, know it, live it. Amen? Amen. Well, right now, I just want to ask everyone at all of our campuses right now uh, just to bow your head and close your eyes. I just want to sp- for us to be able to spend a little bit of time uh, just with God in prayer right now. As we start to pray today, I just want you to ask God. Ask God to search your mind and your heart and ask him to reveal to you if you've been living the extraordinary life, if you've really been doing that, that extraordinary life that he has for you. Have you been living in the reality that God is with you, in you, and for you? Or have you been coming up short? Have you been coming up short maybe at home or at work or, at, or in short in terms of engaging in the big plans that God has for your life? Well, if you know that you've been coming up short in some area of your life of, of not living the extraordinary life that God has for you, I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've been coming up short in some way uh, from living the extraordinary life that God has for you. Praise the Lord. Hands up all over. Me too. I've been coming up short of living the extraordinary life that God has for me. The Spirit of God rests on you. Let me pray for us right now. Father in heaven, I just uh, thank you that you are so good, that you are so loving, God. But at the same time, God, forgive us. Forgive us for looking around uh, to the world around us and following them as opposed to following you and looking up and doing what you have called us to do. Forgive us for coming up short, but thank you so much, God, that you are with us, in us, and for us. And so, God, today, I pray that you just give us courage, you'd give us strength, you'd give us resolve, resolve to live the extraordinary life that you have for us, God. Thank you so much that you are so good and that your plans for us are so extraordinary. Now, I know there are others of you here today that you've never taken that first step on the pathway of making Jesus the leader and the Savior of your life. Know today that if, as you turn to Jesus, if you'll turn to Jesus, he will be with you, in you, and for you. If you'll only call out to him today, he will be with you, in you, and for you. That he will be faithful and he will deliver you. From whatever is going on in your life, he will deliver you today. And so today, I want to just invite you and encourage you to call out to him, to make this moment your moment, to make Jesus Christ the leader and the savior of your life. Take that step today. Don't miss this moment. Pray this prayer with me right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I don't want to live coming up short any longer and so today Jesus I ask you to be the leader and the savior of my life thank you Jesus for dying on the cross for my sins and now use my life Jesus in an extraordinary way to be a blessing and to be a help to other people Now, with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed today, if you made this moment your moment and you made Jesus Christ the leader and the Savior of your life for the very first time, man, I just want you to raise your hand real high right now. Raise your hand real high wherever you're at and say to God, God, I'm in. Raise your hand and say to God right now, God, I'm in so that I can pray for you. Raise your hand real high wherever that you're at. Say, God, I am in today. Raise your hand. Praise the Lord, I see that hand. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God, let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much that you are God, that you love us, that you are with us, in us, and for us. And today, Jesus, I just thank you so much for my friends, my brothers and sisters who surrendered their life to you today. 
God, I pray you just bless them, you'd empower them. God, that you'd give them a glimpse today of the extraordinary life that you have for them. Lord, we love you. We just thank you so much that you're here. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name.